Good afternoon, good night, good morning, wherever you're tuned into, wherever you're tuned in from. My name is Kelly Kellum. Welcome to the BitLab Academy daily stream. We've got a special guest on today uh, who I've had on several times on my podcast, Crypto Answered. I've talked through a lot of different things about the markets, Bitcoin, traditional markets, what's going on, and I'm honored to share him with you. We've, there's a lot going on in the entire sort of global financial ecosystem right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. What's going on with the US dollar? What's going on with insolvencies with banks? What's going on? Where should we be putting our money? How can we forecast where things are going? How can we make sure that we're in the best position? So. Again, welcome to the BitLab Academy daily stream, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Before we get going, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, ding that bell, and join our community here in BitLab Academy. And uh, this is our wonderful person who's coming on, Mr. Jordan Lindsay. This is his Facebook page, and I'm going to jump straight to it. How are you doing, good sir? Thank you for coming on. How are you feeling? What's going on, everyone? What's going on, Kelly? Thanks for having me on. Love talking markets. Enjoy talking markets with you. I know we've done several spaces together, and I'm excited now to go to video format. Yeah, I mean, you know, we just uh, we just met briefly, uh, video face to face here just before the stream, and ended up having a nice little discussion. Uh, I've always enjoyed hearing you speak uh, on the podcast that we've had, and also on other spaces I've tuned into that, that you've done. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting to me that we can share, and I feel honored to be able to share you with our community, is the fact that you're not somebody that jumped into Bitcoin and crypto uh, starting your your journey with investing uh, a few weeks ago or a year or two ago. You have a lot of experience in markets, a good understanding of this balance of this globe, the, the ecosystem that it, that Bitcoin has now become a part of, but it's still a very, very small part of. So with that being said, you know, it's, it's April, 2023. I feel like we're living in the future, but one of the things that I'm realizing that we have to be uh, keeping, keeping ourselves aware of is that Bitcoin is still early in adoption. So as it stands right now with everything going on, you know, recently with Silvergate Bank, uh, Signature, Credit Suisse, now, you know, UBS taking over Credit, Credit Suisse and uh, some issues with Deutsche Banks. So there's so much going on. And then all the stuff going on with the U.S. dollar and the, the, uh, a lot of money starting to be transacted in Chinese yuan, potentially a new monetary uh, asset may be created from the BRICS. How should somebody that's involved in the crypto market right now, what should we be focused on? How do you keep your sanity to keep moving forward in, in this sort of time with understanding these markets? Wow, Kelly. I mean, one of the reasons I really enjoy talking markets with you is the way that you're able to, to frame and articulate questions, really bringing on some good discussion. And while, while, you're, while you're talking about adoption, it just leads me to, to remember that one of my, my, my whole thesis on Bitcoin is the debasement of fiat currency. It's a dollar debt-based system that the only way it could continue mathematically is to continue going ahead and diluting the base. Right now, that's not what's happening. Right now, well, uh, until the banking crisis a couple of weeks ago. Right now, we've been going through actually a pulling back of that of that uh, balance sheet, and we've seen risk markets really react to that. And it kind of it's kind of taking me off the focus of my main thesis: the debasement of the the fiat currency of the dollar and Bitcoin being the hedge against that. And adoption is truly what it's all about. I think this was a great reminder. People talked about you can't taper a Ponzi. Oh, no, no, you could taper a Ponzi, but only for so long. And we've seen right now in the last couple of weeks with the US banking situation, a further added, a huge addition to the balance sheet, a further debasement, Bitcoin reacting off that right away. Kelly, I think that we have to focus on the bigger picture over here, and that is the further uh, growth of adoption in Bitcoin. It's going through an S-curve. At the same time, we need to realize that these are unprecedented times. We're seeing what looks like potentially the final uh, throngs of the current dollar, uh, dollar debt-based system at being the reserve currency of the world. We're seeing other countries, obviously China, Russia, India, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, kind of embracing each other and looking to build a new monetary system, a new world structure. 
And I don't think that the U.S. is going to simply just kind of like sit back and let uh, their grasp on the, on the world and the financial system go. And the reason I say that is because, I, look, I, I love studying, understanding market cycles, the Bitcoin cycle, but we don't know what happens over this next decade. Mm. 2030, the Great Reset, it's, it's monetary reset. And you have powerful people all over the world really jockeying for position. Anyone who believes that it's going to be a straight ride up, I do think might be setting themselves up for failure. I hope that 2022 was a really good reminder that anything could happen at any time. The whole, I'm going to just dollar cost average into Bitcoin, but all like I'm betting on everything. I mean, that might not end well. That might not end well. I don't know anyone else who believes in Bitcoin uh, besides all of you than myself, who really, who really embrace Bitcoin as a hope for for a fair and just future for the world. I have six kids. Their future is really important to me, and Bitcoin offers hope. There's no question about that. But but Kelly, we all need to really be proactive in protecting our future when it comes to they fight you stage. We don't know really what that will look like and for how long. I think we could do better. And that, and that's why we have these conversations over here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you there. And, you know, I had a, a conversation with my mother the other day who, if my mother is a great sounding board for the, um, I don't even know, I don't want to call it anti-crypto, but she, she's the most fiscally conservative person I've ever met. If she overspends a dollar twenty-two on her grocery uh, uh, budget, the, the second she gets home, she's on a spreadsheet and she's taking that dollar twenty-two off something else. Uh, you know, she's trying to convince me as hard as hard as, as hard as she can currently to make some sort of investment uh, with any of the cash I have on the sideline into the CD because it has. Three uh, uh, percent, and in, in my mind, it's it's just two different two different worlds, you know. And the reason I bring that up is uh, when FTX collapsed in November of last year. I remember my mom not 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 really saying "I told you so," but kind of, you know, how bad Bitcoin is because FTX collapsed. So, and, and you know, I was trying to you know have this uh, this conversation with her without you know. Having the conversation about something that somebody doesn't understand it or is already sort of uh, polarized against, but based on you know consistent FUD media narrative or what whatever the reason is, we can't just force what we think we know down somebody else's throat because you actually drive them further away. So when she brought this up about FTX, I was trying to make this argument about you know it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's been you know processing blocks every ten minutes. Uh, you know, without fail, there's been no change in how how great and how revolutionary blockchain technology and Bitcoin is. It goes back to having the playbook from traditional banking uh, systems and banking services integrating into the Bitcoin and, and crypto world. F, F, you know, FTX is a great example of that. And I think it, I think it caught the world off. I think it caught Sam off guard, and a lot of people when uh, that banking playbook. He didn't do anything different than banks are doing, which is a crazy thing. And he is the worst guy in the world. Now, I don't agree with what he did at all, but I think it's crazy at how much negativity and how, how you know, it's, it's a narrative focus on how bad Bitcoin is because FTX collapsed. So I asked her recently when we saw Credit Suisse collapse, fall, you know, uh, before that it was SVB, before that it was uh, you know, Silvergate. Uh, it, just so on and so forth. I asked her what she thought about uh, the CEOs of those companies and if she felt any differently about, for instance, the U.S. dollar because these banks are collapsing now. So is the U.S. dollar broken? And she had a whole different argument about it and how and why. So for somebody, you know, you being a cultured of both the traditional finance world as well as crypto and Bitcoin, let's let's differentiate Bitcoin from crypto uh, in this case. But what would you say to somebody that's on the fence? Maybe this is their first video they've ever seen uh, regarding uh, Bitcoin that they've been open to listening to, or somebody's watching this and they have a relative and you, you know, they can send them a link to watch this video. What would you say in this sort of argument about all these things and the difference, the cognitive, cognitive dissonance that's involved with all this? 
why is Bitcoin, how is Bitcoin valuable and why is it better than the US dollar? Or is it better than the US dollar? Or fiat? Yeah, currency, narratives really. are really powerful. You, you hit it right on the head there. Bitcoin is rat poison. That little soundbite from Warren Buffett has made an impression on a litany of people. And because they heard that one day through CNBC or we're just somewhere, people that are, are far separated from the Bitcoin market, from the crypto market, they've heard Bitcoin is rat poison. Warren Buffett said it. He's protecting the legacy system. They don't even understand what the legacy system is. If you ask them if the dot was the dollar backed by, they'd probably say gold. If <laughs> if if, War. if they knew a little bit more, they might yeah. say, you know, by the power and might of the US government, which we've seen. I mean, no question, but we've seen empires fall. So, you know, narratives are super, super powerful. And uh, the, the media machine that's protecting these empires are also super powerful. You know, Satoshi was the one who said, listen, if you don't understand, I don't have time to convince you. Hmm. And that might sound a little bit harsh right now. But the thing is, I've spent time with people, those people in my life, people who have seen my success, people who saw years ago when I made the bullish case for Bitcoin and why, and still, you know, when the time is right, and I'm like, hey, listen, Bitcoin is it's, it's under 17,000. That's a good time. And then like catching up over the weekend, they're like, oh, what's Bitcoin at now? Like 22,000. I'm like, I don't know, I think like 28, 29,000. They're like, ah, oh. and, and they're, you're not, I'm not here to convince them, I'm here to help you. Though all of you, anyone here, for whatever reason, has been able to distinguish that there's something going on over here. I would like to know and understand more. However, narratives are strong even within these communities and maybe not really for, for the benefit of us all. And I think that right now it's, it's important as we're having this conversation when thinking about the legacy finance financial system, in understanding that the next move is going to be to, to central bank digital currencies, right? And why they're doing that and what the process is going to look like. Look, Bitcoin is a hedge against the financial system. That means that if the financial system were to fail, you, you and your family are going to be safe and protected. Does that mean that you should take your whole entire net worth and throw it into Bitcoin and then worse and then be like, okay, it's inevitable for sure. I'm going to make it. That doesn't sound so smart. It's a hedge. How much of your overall net worth do you want to put into that hedge? And I think before you do anything else, personally, you should be hedged. You should head, you should, you, you have your income, you have your job, you have income coming in. You should have your hedge, right? Gold is another hedge. Right. Is it likely that gold is going to be repriced in our current lifetime? Likely. Right. Especially whoever or however this new monetary system evolves into, whether or not it is, for example, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. leading the way and it's a move into the digital dollar, whether or not it's the BRICS, whether or not it's the IMF. And by the way, the whole I read in 2018, a white paper by the IMF talking about central bank digital currencies, and they were going to be backed by the SDR, the special drawing rights of the IMF, gold likely will be repriced. So you have a hedge into gold. Yeah. Is that an investment? No, I don't think it, it, you should look at that as an investment. I think that you should look at it as worst case situation. You have something preserving your purchasing power. Do I think that Bitcoin is going to outperform gold over, over the next five years? Of course I do. Does that mean that you shouldn't own gold? Absolutely not. Now, you, ha you have your hedges, Kelly, but you also need to work on investments, right? And some people use a lot of a lot of big Bitcoin maxis are really against any type of speculation inside altcoins. Why? Well, a lot of them have speculated inside altcoins and they lost money. They didn't know what they were doing. And they figure if they can't do it, that you can. That seems ridiculous to me. Ethereum has been largely outperforming Bitcoin since I could remember. If you're not taking advantage of trading Ethereum in order to stack more Bitcoin, I think that you're, I think you're not really playing on a high level. And that goes across the board.
But the thing is, is Kelly, I think that people need to be really smart and methodical about the way that they go about investing in the markets. The markets really attract the brightest minds throughout the whole world competing for capital. If you think that you're just going to go in there, take the easy way out and get lucky, get, get lucky, you may. When the bull of all bulls begins running and Bitcoin, the rising tide that lifts all boats, when the Federal Reserve begins actual outright easing and quantitative, quantitative easing, buying securities again, you're going to see Bitcoin, you're going to see crypto running, and everyone's going to be look like an expert and think they're an expert. It's a difference who's able to, to come out on the other end of that cycle way ahead and those who are going to wind up like getting really emotional, do some good things, get lucky, and then give it all back and then some. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're talking about the price uh, moments, for instance, when we were at $64,000 or, or when it pulled back and then it went back up to 68, uh, 69, where, wherever that mm -hmm. secondary top was. And you have all this retail emotional buying, buying. Uh, and I think Mark Yusko says it best. You know, any asset in the world, you throw it on sale. You look at Black Friday sales on Friday, the, the day after Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and it's, an, it's an, an embarrassment to be an American on that day because you see people running over each other to get into Walmart to get a, you know, uh, a, you know Xbox for 30% off or something like that. Whereas with financial assets, and it's because there's not, a, there's not a lot of financial literacy. All of us need to be more, more humbly aware. It's not a judgment on you. It's not a judgment on me. We need more financial literacy in this world that we can see that because the price is going down doesn't mean that asset's bad. Price is uh, a demarcation of the speculative speculative value of that asset, not the true underlying value. Not you, you know, you're not utilizing fundamental data and seeing adoption growth rates continue. For instance, in all of 2022, when we had a a never ending what felt like uh, felt like during it a never ending bear market. Looking back now, already in hindsight is basically exactly the same length as every, as every bear, bear market in history, you know, but in the middle of it, it's like, this is never going to end. And, but then as you, as you navigate this space and build a harder shell and stop being emotional trader and you're using data to trade rather than the price you use data and you see, you see price as a data point price going down, but the fundamental data that we can get into, whether it's on chain data whether it's uh, the adoption rates, a hash rate, it doesn't matter what the, your basket of data points are that give you your edge. But when you're seeing fundamental network growth while speculative value is dropping, that's those moments tying it back to what you said earlier, when you know somebody that knows you're in crypto, they see the price drop down from 60 to 20 and they say, how's the market now? Somebody that's been in the space goes, Man, this is excellent. I've been waiting for this opportunity to to stack more. Somebody that hasn't been in the space as long or just wasn't well positioned or didn't understand their time horizon feels horrible because this was the worst investment decision of their life. And the only difference was ha not having a plan, not having data on their side versus emotion buying hype. So what would you say, and we can get into some charts here in a, in a few minutes too. So anybody, anybody that's wa uh, watching here, make sure you're hitting that like button, hitting that subscribe button, ding that bell. Join us here in the BitLab community because we're trying to bridge that gap from beginner to pro or at least beginner to data a culture trader with an investor. You should actually be more of an investor than a trader, picking those good points in the market. So what would you say to somebody, whether they've been in the market for a day or two years or 10 years, to... When you approach a trading desk or you're sitting down trying to make an investment decision, what are what are a couple basic strategies or data points that you like to look at, especially if we're talking about specifically Bitcoin? Do you only look at a Bitcoin chart or are you pulling up other data points from traditional assets to give you an edge? Are you using any specific tools, whether they're basic like stochastics or RSI? Or what's, what's your basic, basic setup that you would recommend to, uh, to a beginner when they're trying to, when you're trying to get them to look at data over just price action? Yeah. Can we pull up a chart? Let's, let's talk about it. Let's do it. And uh, yeah, share screen. let's really get into it. I, I think you really hit it on the the board. The board. Hey Kelly, you hit it on the board. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gotta open up. Hold on one sec, Kelly. All right. Give me one second here. So yeah, I can share. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. As you're doing that, 
I just wanted to show everybody. You're not going to be able to see this, uh, 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 Jordan. This is a heat map of all the people ask, is Bitcoin really worth it? You can't buy anything with it. It's not used for anywhere. Well, first off, I will argue that it is at this current stage should be looked at more of a store, a store of value than a transactable currency sort of uh, a type of asset. But even as it stands, that argument fails because we can see right here, there's over, this is as of October of 2022, I believe. Yeah, October 2022, 15,174 businesses worldwide except Bitcoin. We can see on this heat map, heat map this is the US alone, all the different places that accept Bitcoin. Uh, and we sc scroll out here, we can see that it, I mean, this is growing like wildfire across the world, and we're so early. This is why this type of stream that we're really excited to have, anybody that's here in the comments, please throw in the comment right now. Are you bullish? Are you bearish? Where? What are you feeling? Did you just get in? What, like, what are you feeling about the markets? Are you hopeful or are you here uh, to learn even, even, even if you are afraid? Because we're so early in the development of this. So it's critical that you are on these types of streams learning what you can do because just, just the, the more people in this space dive into education and knowledge and try to give themselves tools to understand how to navigate the space, the stronger the space becomes and the more natural sort of Bitcoin missionaries in a way we all become to our friends and family, not because we have to talk about it because they see the standard of our life going, going up because we're making smart decisions in the market rather than buying at the peak and then being washed out at the bottom and then basically being a negative seed to those around us. Cause now it looks again, like crypto is a scam and it's not. Our trading strategies are the biggest scam in the space. Our strategies that we do that we don't use, where we're leaning into emotions rather than having a strategy, it's usually on us individuals. So I'm happy to have you all here. And again, I want to just pull up uh, Jordan's. Uh, this is his uh, where you can follow him at. It's at Jordan Lindsay, but it's two underscores. Jordan underscore underscore Lindsay. So go ahead and follow him. I'm pulling you back up. Let's get on your charts. Let's talk about some of the things you got in mind. And thank you. Yeah, that's absolute fire. What a great setup too. You're gonna love. You're gonna really enjoy this. I'm gonna love sharing it with you. Kelly, I gotta I gotta restart my machine, my, not my machine, my Zoom here in order to be able to share my screen. So you might have to do. I'm so sorry about that. You were just. I wanted to make sure you finished what you were sharing because you were just right, in well, the. Oh, you go ahead. Uh, hop out of Zoom. I'll, I'll I'll hop onto something else while this continues. So what I really wanted to talk about here is the fact that we can see this. We can see. How, how many different places around the world? This is not just a US-based thing. In fact, over 80% of the Bitcoin held, I think it was a number, don't quote me specifically on that, but roughly about 80% of the Bitcoin held is held internationally, not a US thing. So when we're not US-based uh, uh, ownership. So if that's the case, and we're looking at, as Jordan was speaking about a second ago, the, you know, the, this hedge against the US dollar, the hedge against the economy, the hedge against... The, the financial and monetary systems. The reason why I'm pulling up this heat map isn't just to show you that Bitcoin is transactable in different places, is to show you specifically tying back to what Jordan said, that if the US dollar is going to pivot away from being the, the world reserve currency, and if we are to protect ourselves as smart investors, doesn't mean we need to put 100% of our assets into Bitcoin or all into crypto. But if this is a case, and the U.S. reserve currency starts pivoting away to whether it's the Chinese yuan, maybe it's another currency that's created from the BRICS nations, whatever it is. And we're seeing that 80, roughly 80 percent of the, the Bitcoin held is held internationally. This is one of the examples why Bitcoin is such a great alternative to the fiat system in at least in the U.S., but also no matter where you live in the world, wherever you're tuned in from, Put in the comments down below or here in the live chat where you tuned in from. I'd like to see how far reaching, how many people we got uh, from all over the world. But it's a good point here to, to remember that this is not just a Western-based thing. And in addition to that, I also wanted to make one more comment. We look at this in the U.S., in the Western world. We forget how privileged we are that we look at it, this is only a store of value. Why would we, why would we transact with this to buy, uh, whether it's a pizza or a cup of coffee, well, when you look at one of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, many of the African nations, the fluctuation and volatility in their currency there 
uh, is such, and the uh, the ability or the inability to be banked in a lot of those places is such that in a lot in a lot of ways, Bitcoin and other crypto crypto uh, projects and protocols like Cardano uh, or Ethereum or something that'd be faster, uh, AVAX. Uh, these other protocols are providing the opportunity for people to to be banked to transact. And so they're not looking at it so much specifically as just, I'm going to invest in this to make money. They need some way to transact between each other. So there's a lot of different use cases beyond what we think in the Western world. And we're so early in adoption. So we got Mr. Jordan is back on the line here. So my little rant and rave is done. I just wanted to remind people, the, the US or anywhere in the Western world that you live in Europe, UK, there's more to the world than just this Western colonial world that we've developed we have an entire global ecosystem that is ripe for having the opportunity to be self-banked without having the regulations of some imperial uh sort of uh i don't even know what the word is uh jordan what do we call it what do we call it when uh for instance like in uh like an african nation when they have a foreign uh a foreign country that is running their monetary system, like whether it be the, you know- uh, uh, Slavery, we, we call yeah. it slavery, yeah. Exactly, economic yeah. slavery. And then they can yeah. debase the value of that currency to that nation by half, which we've seen in some locations in Africa, because some other country with other the interests- French. Has The French, the French, yeah. yeah. But Bitcoin, you can't do that because of the supply. But let's jump into these charts. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. I talk on here every day, so I'm gonna shut up. I'm even gonna take my face off. Let's focus on these it's charts. One of the greatest evils in the world, the central bank system is one of the greatest evils in the entire world. And the thing is, is that people don't even understand that they're being enslaved. It's, abs it's, it's absolutely horrific. Kelly, I'm glad you brought that up. Listen, I got, I, I love going over these charts with you all. And Kelly, the way that you really uh, understand things, I, I, I really appreciate. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna be answering that question. What is the best way for someone, a beginner to go about investing in, Bit in Bitcoin and, and, and the cryptocurrency markets? We're gonna be doing it, Kelly, though, in a way that's also super advanced. So I wanna be able to blend the two. You're really going to appreciate You know what, Jordan? The tagline that I've said on here a multiple multiple times every show is the goal of this show is to really provide advanced tools and strategies, but to bridge the gap from beginner to pro. So use advanced strategies, but break them down in the concepts in a way that anybody can utilize. So yeah, you jump in at right any point money. in time. If, if you find something interesting and you want to be able to kind of describe what you're seeing and things like that. But I'm gonna start off with just like looking at the overall all-time chart here of Bitcoin. And Kelly a few times has talked about adoption, adoption, adoption. It's an S-curve. This S-curve occurs in technology. It's something that VCs in the Valley have looked at in order to make their investments. It's, it's happening in Bitcoin. And you can see this first phase, which is a hype phase. And then we go into this phase of an S-curve, which is the facing reality. And then ultimately, if we make it out, we'll end, in, we'll end up in the ultimate market opportunity, right? Now, Bitcoin is still going through the facing reality stage. You could see that right now. It's undergoing, let's say, uh, lots of um, uh, you know, uncertainty within, within the space itself with these exchanges such as FTX, these scams that are going down. Government's coming against it. Don't forget over here, you saw China ban Bitcoin multiple times. Ultimately, they weren't able to do it. You saw Russia first ban Bitcoin, then embrace Bitcoin. Uh, maybe it's the US's turn to learn eventually that you can't ban Bitcoin. They might try eventually, I believe, so long as adoption continues. Kelly, you've mentioned some on-chain things such as number of addresses throughout this session today. And even in the bear market here, you've seen those adoption continues to grow. Now, you could look at that from a few different ways. It's kind of funny. Every four years, you know, you have the halving of the miners reward. And you see that the miners for securing the network, what they're receiving in compensation for doing that their reward is is cut in half every four years. So if it was two Bitcoin the following year to be four years from then, or 
210,000 blocks, approximately four years, you'd get one Bitcoin. And then another 210,000 blocks, you would get a half a Bitcoin. Now, it's debatable whether or not the halving of the miner's reward actually causes these massive moves up that we've seen after every halving, or if it's just more closely aligned with the monetary cycle set forth in the traditional financial system. I think it's probably a combination of both because you start seeing a lot of people really speculating on what's going to happen. And, and either which way, here we go again, it seems to be happening once again. Now, this this area is over here, Kelly, and I'm going to so start let, off really let, 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 let me ask you a question there, though, because, you know, what, we don't need to get into a uh, 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 discourse about whether Satoshi Nakamoto was one person or a group of people or uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Do you think right. that, I mean, because, because the development and the way Bitcoin is engineered is so uh, spectacularly, uh, it's, it's spectacular how it's, yeah. how, how it's done. And, and we, we have this, art, this regular discourse amongst different analysts and different people within the crypto ecosystem uh, about the four-year cycle. And you just po you point you just hinted at something or mentioned something that I you know I think about a lot uh, and I talked about it with one of uh, one of our uh, in, uh, on staff people here Alex Green uh, shared a chart with me that he broke down as well uh, basically not arguing against the four year cycle but arguing that exact point does it have something more to do potentially with the monetary cycles of markets of global markets and the reason I the question here is. Do you think potentially that the four-year halving cycle may have been, or the 210,000 blocks, which he, you could kind of calculate would be roughly around four years, might have something to do also with his understanding of how monetary systems, uh, the global monetary systems and liquidity were flowing so that the mining cuts would also align in the most beneficial way when liquidity was coming back in the market? I mean, wow, if, if, if Satoshi did... Wow. I, I don't know. I think that actually my own opinion would be that Satoshi was brilliant enough to understand that boom and bust cycles will cause adoption. Mm -hmm. And in the early on, the the having of, of the Bitcoin miners reward, it did cause this, these boom and then bust cycles. I do see now that the having cycles are aligned with the traditional monetary uh, the, the tightening cycle set forth and the easing cycle set forth by really the Federal Reserve. And they happen to be aligned really well. If Satoshi planned that on purpose, I don't think so. I think that going back when Bitcoin was launched, coming out of uh, the Great Recession, the, the bankers bailout 2008, it would have been really difficult for anyone as we started undergoing quantitative easing for the first time to be able to have that type of foresight. I think that there's a lot of providence involved in all of this. As we look at, for example, things like a push towards a new monetary system, one of central bank digital currencies where these uh, central institutions have complete control over how long you're able to even have your money in your account without it disappearing, where you could spend it, how it's spent, things like this, that Bitcoin exists. I think that if we're already under uh, a regime of these central bank digital currencies, that Bitcoin would not have the chance even to be launched and or uh, gain the adoption that it has. So I, I think there's a lot of providence involved. And I think that that might be, you know, just one of those, I, I chalk it up to, to really just a good thing, coincidence, that the Bitcoin halving cycle is so closely aligned with the monetary cycle. And, and I think that as you go further towards the beginning of the of the launch of Bitcoin, those having cycles had more of an effect than they will going forward. I think for this upcoming cycle, it's more of a psychological effect. You're going to see a lot of sentiment and people wanting to speculate and front run the having. Now, it does look like that it will align also with the uh, the monetary cycle as Right around the having, it looks like, or before it, it looks like the Federal Reserve will have pivoted to rate cuts uh, because of a potential slowdown in the economy, and then even be easing at that point. So it might line up again. And, and just because this has played out in the past, Kelly, does not mean at all that it's going to play out in the future. 
including we've seen off the lows over here. Let me just show you how that looks from a couple of different angles. Some people believe that April was the really the structural high, even though price made a, a all time high in November. And if I, it were, I, I agree with that as well, just based on based on uh, two two key points. One, a lot of the on chain data, but then two, looking specifically, I don't know if you've ever looked at the Bitcoin price when you look at it against the M2 money supply, the yeah. the because of inflation, the first peak actually was higher because the dollar devalued already so much that the second peak didn't even reach the high of the second peak based on the inflation that happened in that short window of time, which is another, you know, uh, feather in the cap for Bitcoin because Bitcoin's value intrinsically has gone up because supply is going down over time. While even in these short windows, how much uh, U.S. dollar is devaluing in that in that same time period? Yeah, I, I don't know which I believe, whether it's April or November, and I can make cases for both, and I'm comfortable with that. I like actually instead of having like this is my thesis and this is what I believe, I like being able to view multiple vantage points, multiple uh, views, and get a better picture, and then decide. I mean, I was having a, a conversation with Ben and uh, Ben Cowan, and he showed me the sentiment in November. And at this point, I was le leaning heavily towards April being the all time high. And in November, whether you're looking at, at YouTube views overall across all crypto related channels, uh, Twitter uh, followers, things like this. Yeah, that was the engagement. highest in November. So I was like, wait. And then ultimately, you just talked about M2. I, I will then bring up in one second, uh, monetary uh, supply total. It is, don't forget, the, I, I brought up early, Kelly, in 2020, people asked, as we were just starting the bull market, what, what's the greatest risk? Is it, is it tether? Is, what, what's the greatest risk? And, and I always said, well, the greatest risk will be the Federal Reserve and the monetary policy. And it was, it was just two weeks earlier that they pivoted and they said that they were going to taper down their quantitative easing purchases and get ready for those those rate hikes. So that that points to November at all. And, and again, if you were looking at April here, and it looks to me like these three cycles are pretty similar. And even so over I, here- I, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you just for a moment, just because uh, I, I, I regularly have to remind myself- as, as easily understandable as this chart is to me, I want to make sure if, if this is somebody's first time seeing this type of chart or if you've seen these a lot and you have no idea what the heck is going on, what this is is three different market cycles overlaid on the same, basically on the, uh, the time periods and how they played out. So rather than seeing them linearly like this, he has them broken, has them broken down in different colors. You can see, for instance, uh, go back to the other one with the, the linear uh, progression. Yeah, so we, we've got this area here overlaid on top of this, overlaid on top of this uh, on the on the multicolor chart. So I just wanted to break that down in case anybody was seeing any confusion. You can hop back to the other chart. Sorry for the interruption. Keep doing that. No, no, that's yeah. that's really important stuff. I, I want to bring everyone if possible with us. And as we get into some really interesting things, I sometimes, you know, just automatically assume that everyone has had the same life experience I have had. Keep doing that, really. In, in white over here, we're looking at the current Bitcoin cycle. We're looking at if price was at peaking in April of 2021. And then you could see in, in blue over here, we have 2017 top and then the 2013 top. And if you line them all up, you could see that structurally, these are all very, very similar, right? And, and also I just wanna bring up two things. Over here, you could see that this is where it's different because Bitcoin bottoms over here and not over here where the past two did. Now, it's debatable if we didn't have the implosion of FTX, whether or not this would have been the bottom or not. So right. you know, you, again, we're gonna keep going back and forth. And, and even in this area, price kicks up to a no all time high, but structurally it looks very similar as those. And it looks like, we are getting ready as we approach that having for price to be remotely similar to how it's been in the past. And let's look at that also from this view where price did peak in November. And then you could line up these three cycles again, Kelly, and, and this time they're all bottoming in the same area. 
and and coming out, we call this the front running of the having. It is a very similar price behavior that we saw in the last cycle in in 2018. Uh, this is early 2019, sorry. And then we call this phase coming up the accumulation phase, right? Now, whether or not price is able to go ahead and, and you can see in the past two cycles off the low, it was able to retrace all the way to this fib, fib, fib level, the 0 0.786 level. It's around $50,000 Bitcoin. You could see that in the in in the, the 2012 cycle, it did that. You could see that again in the 2016 cycle, it did it. And here in 2024, it, it may do that. And then it should run up into this accumulation phase prior to the halving. It's roughly six months after the halving that in the past price has made a new all-time high. As that happens, the people that you've been trying to convince, hey, now's a good time to buy Bitcoin. They're FOMOing, FOMOing in, they're, they're buying Bitcoin. And then you have all these other people that start looking at all coins. They're like, Bitcoin's too expensive. I, I, I have to buy something that's really cheap. And they start all this speculation inside the altcoin market. And, and, then and, you and I, I just want to cut in there because I think that is a key, key point you just brought up that I, I hope every single person that's tuned into this stream right now, if you don't know it yet, I hope you really lean into understanding that because Bitcoin is $28,000 or $60,000 and Cardano is 30 cents or a dollar doesn't make Cardano so much more affordable than Bitcoin because you're, you're not taking into account of a Bitcoin. Yeah, you're right. You're, it's, you're not going to, you're not going to buy Cardano or Dogecoin or name any coin. Doesn't matter. Uh, it really doesn't matter what coin we're talking about. AVAX, uh, doesn't matter what it is. If it's 30 cents, five cents or $10, if you're trying to get that because it's so cheap. And what if that goes up to $28,000? It's one of the biggest misnomers and misun ignorant. I don't mean ignorant mainly. I mean, necessarily ignorant uh, understandings uh, or, or lenses that newcomers have on the market. Because one, you don't need to buy a full Bitcoin. You can buy up to 100 million divisions of Bitcoin. You can, you can buy $5, $1, $100, whatever is within your budget. And it has more to do with the token supply uh, or, or, or token or coin supply of that asset as it relates to the number that are available and then the speculative price. So while Cardano might be, let's say right now, for instance, it's, a, it's roughly the 36 to 40 cent range and Bitcoin is currently uh, in the, you know, uh, 27 to $30,000 $30, range, it doesn't mean that uh, Cardano you're getting a better deal because Cardano may go up to $28,000. Cardano has 49 billion coins. Bitcoin will only ever have 21 million. So that's one of the most basic things that we need to always remember to remind anybody, if they're a friend, family member, or somebody new watching the space, really try to understand tokenomics before you invest. So, 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 yeah. Kelly, what, what, what was that coin that yesterday Elon Musk put on Twitter? A Doge. The Doge coin, right? Yeah. How many Bitcoin will there ever be? 21 million total and they've, they've already estimated 21 million. about about three to four million are probably lost forever so uh, let's to help people the, understand what you just said kelly every yeah. 35 days a new 21 million doge coins are printed so you're saying it has a similar monetary supply as the u.s dollar it's just inflation <laughs> to the max well yeah. sometimes the u.s dollar they can track that supply that's not happening with with dogecoin but no what you're saying is very important you you Look, you said it earlier, Bitcoin and crypto, separate the two. Kelly, you've been pointing out adoption, network effects. How many people are using Bitcoin? How many wallet address addresses are there? Ethereum has enormous network effects. And you could think of this as kind of like uh, Apple OS and Android, right? There, there's room for more than one player, right? A lot of, again, maybe uh, those that embrace the, the, the label of a Bitcoin maximalism, they have really uh, maybe really done themselves and others a disservice in helping not understand where this space is going and the best way for people to position themselves throughout it. Again, have that Bitcoin position, keep it in cold storage. This is your hedge against the financial system a financial system that is destined to end badly. That's why they call it the Great Reset. 
It's monetary reset. It could only go on for so long. It is ending. Yeah, you know what? I'm really glad you brought up. That was a great analogy between OS, uh, Mac, uh, sorry, uh, iPhones and Android, uh, because this goes back to the the discourse earlier uh, where I was talking about uh, the Western world, how privileged we don't realize we are. Uh, in that, you know, especially in the U.S., we have this idea that the you know the iPhone is the dominant phone. Well, if you look globally. The, the, the number one smartphone in globally is not the iPhone. It's too expensive for most of the world. And the, right. the, uh, the Android devices, uh, which is basically, I don't want, it's not open source, but you're able to use mul multiple different devices are able to license that operating system. And therefore that ecosystem has, uh, that has thrived beyond that of the iPhone. However, you know, this brings up the point of, you know, diversification, which is a whole nother topic we can go down. We Maybe we'll touch on it uh, more, but it, let, let's continue what we were talking about here with. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, show you something you're going to find really interesting, and it's going to bring up a whole new questions uh, for yeah. yourself. And I'm going to start here with this. And this picture here is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. All right. And we could see ever since 2008, this is where QE started. And we had this massive expansion of the balance sheet. I remember at the time, it was absolutely ridiculous. You know what else I remember, Kelly? George Bush Jr. was president. And he yeah. did this bank bailout. I, I think it was $350 billion. Numbers that were astronomical to us at the time. And then I remember the day that the new president-elect Obama came to the White House. And these two like met for some coffee or tea or whatever they were doing. And and as they left, he's like, my good friend here, he asked that I give the next $350 billion to the bankers. So I'm going to respect the incoming president's wishes. I said to myself, wow, these guys are on the same team. And, and that's the truth of it. And it's, it's these money masters against yep. us. And we all need to be working together to help educate each other. You have an enormous opportunity today to be able to look onto YouTube and to teach yourself and give yourself an education that was not possible 15 years ago. That was not so possible. Let, me, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question for pretend uh, it's my first day. I'm, I'm your seven year old son. And I, uh, you know, you're trying to just impart some wisdom as to, you know, how to understand what you're talking about here. What's, what's the most basic description you can give for why it's what, for instance, what, the, what is the federal, what is the balance sheet? What does this mean? And why is this relevant to liquidity and markets? And why is this relevant to risk on risk off narratives? Yeah. I mean, so I, I have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, a five-year-old and all, all as they know is, well, two things, you know, Bitcoin is boring. That's, that's the, that's the <laughs> meme that you'll hear from, from my oldest. And, and then the youngest will, will response will be, no, no Bitcoin is money. <laughs> and then the one in between that, she she loves shiny things. So she embraces Bitcoin because she believes that that will help her get some shiny things. And and all that's fun and all that's true. But I get the I get the spirit of your of your question. And and Kelly, let, let me just let me explain it in two ways and then we'll come back and answer that. All right. So we have over here starting in 2008, this massive expansion of the balance sheet. And then we're where we are right now. And we just had this another big expansion of the balance sheet, right? And I want to bring this up visually so people could see that you were seeing right over here. You're looking at two things. You're looking at the price of Bitcoin and you're looking at the global liquidity from the four biggest economies in the world. You're looking at the United States. You're looking at Europe, the ECB, China, and you're looking at Japan. And you could see how closely these two charts line up. One would say that they follow each other, especially off here off the bottom. This is where Bitcoin bottomed. It is this, let me go ahead and, and just show you. So this is Bitcoin. This is global liquidity. And you could see that they are following each other almost completely. So I'm gonna mark up your chart. So right here, what I'm seeing, just as an analyst and somebody that's in markets all the time, what I'm seeing right there is the fact that we've got, uh, this is the Bitcoin bottom right here, and this is the global liquidity right here, correct? That's correct. So what we're, so how I would basically uh, discuss this, uh, you know, looking well, at it- Kelly, I, I would argue if FTX never collapsed over there, 
that Bitcoin would not have had that deviation early in November and would have tracked more closely the global liquidity. No, no, I, 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 com I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. And just as fast as Bitcoin price moved down right here, it moved up right here. But what I'm yeah. really seeing here is if we look at this, like let's, let's pretend the global liquidity, which is this line here, let's pretend this is a strength indicator or stochastics or some technical okay. indicator, right? What I'm seeing here is uh, price action falling and as, as and we're seeing liquidity come in. So we're essentially seeing uh, a, a bullish divergence in one of the most important factors of the market. Liquidity that's looking for somewhere to go. Uh, a, a lot of FUD right here with the FTX collapse and uncertainty. Smart money buys at this, this, this buys the fear. It stabilizes because all the weak hands and people not looking at data, looking at just the speculative value are shaken out. We see it stabilize. And then that liquidity is then redeployed into the price. And we actually break this massive, uh, my very crooked lines, massive downtrends uh, that we see right here, finally breaking through that. So now this is, this is a great chart. It's uh, and it's, a key thing to remember to all of us here in the U.S. and and in the Western world that what the Fed does isn't the only thing that affects liquidity in the markets. We're seeing China starting to print uh, yep. pretty heavily. Uh, China, oh, yeah. Japan, uh, all these things, and the U.S. especially right now with the with the the precarious situation. I do not have. Uh, it, I mean, I, I have a lot of compassion for Jerome Powell and the Fed trying to figure out what to do. Do they save the banks? Do they save the dollar? Do they try to keep up with competing economies? But we're seeing liquidity come into global markets. And th this is a phenomenal chart. Yeah, thank you for sharing it, this. It, I mean, you're, you're hitting on the head. Liquid, liquidity, and it doesn't have to be just from the Fed, is coming into the markets. And 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 this is, I think, look, look we're going we're gonna, to, at the end, wind up simplifying this for everyone. I hope that those that are here listening are able to just learn something new, see something, hear something that is going to continue to compound in their overall knowledge. This chart, Kelly, is going to is for fun, right? And, and it's important that you have fun in growing and understanding the markets. Because when I say it's for fun, is because look over here. This is Bitcoin topping, and you can see it comes off forty percent. And you can see global liquidity. I mean, sorry, I moved this over. You can see it comes off 40% over here. And global liquidity didn't peak over here. It, it, three months later, that's a big deviation. That's a long time to be off, uh, off sides. That didn't happen just there. If I come to the top of, of 2017, let me go ahead and show you the last Bitcoin top. And you can see that Bitcoin tops here, it comes off 60%. And it's not for a long time later that global liquidity comes off. So if you think or anyone thinks that like, oh, I could just follow global liquidity. No, it's it, it, again, you see this all over Twitter and it's nice. It's a piece of the puzzle, but that's 40%, 60%. That's a long time to be off sides. Let me yeah, show piece, you a better piece, piece of the thing. puzzle. Piece of the puzzle, yeah. I think is the best, best word. I, I actually was using that exact nomenclature in the stream earlier earlier this week that I don't care if you think you have the best indicator in the world, yeah. if you're yeah. the best chart price action reader, in reality, anybody that's consistently positive, not even just prof profitable, just not negative in markets is utilizing a variety of different yeah. data points to put, to, to, to put together a thesis and try to also disprove it. If you can disprove your thesis, it's not a good, it's not a good opportunity. If you have all the pieces of the puzzle pointing in a direction, then that's when you take your shot and still have risk management with it. But th th this, this is, this is really the direction. This is the direction. The direction is going to continue to be this way. All right. That's very similar to the chart of Bitcoin, except that during these particular times over here, this is quantitative tightening. Bitcoin came off 85 percent. This, is, again, is quantitative tightening. You can you can taper a Ponzi but only for so long. And right now they're doing it. And you saw Bitcoin come off another 75, 80%. This is, this is the thesis, but Kelly, if you're trying to go ahead over the next 10 years to do something extraordinary, to be able to build serious generation wealth, it's not, I'm just gonna buy and hold Bitcoin. Do that as your hedge. Make sure that you have that as a hedge against the fan, but you could do better in timing these cycles. And it's not like you're just guessing you could do something simple like looking at the liquidity of the Federal Reserve's 
balance sheet to time it. Look over here. And I just want to point this out. This was the U.S. banks failing. I know you want to get into that and talk about that. We, we will. Um, but what I want to point out is quantitative tightening is still running. I don't know if any more banks are going to need help in the near future and whether or not we're going to see the balance sheet continue to rise or if quantitative tighten is going to continue to pull off and is going to stress risk assets. Even though we look at these charts and in the past we've seen this four-year cycle behavior play out, it does not mean that is what we're going to see. So we have to make sure instead of getting comfortable that we work hard together to stay on the right side. Kelly, this over here is we looked at being off sides for 40%. That's a long time. If you looked at this chart in light blue over here, this is the Federal Reserve balance sheet, monetary based total. So it includes all reserves held at the Federal Reserve, where this is more reflective of M2, all credit on top of those reserves. And you can see over here, as that begins pulling back, that gave a much better topping signal. That happens again over here if we go back to 2018, 2017, December, the last top. You could see once again why this was off 60 percent looking at uh, looking at a combination of liquidity. This gave a much better topping signal. And the reason I point that out is because it's much better to consult multiple vantage points. This one over here winds up giving a, a much better bottom signal. I thought you would appreciate that one. So that one's for you if you want me to share that chart when we get off no, here. We'll do that. Yeah. All right. So let's let's keep going. And and as we do, um, right now we're looking at the NASDAQ, and this is just going to be in relation to Bitcoin. We've seen the NASDAQ put in a couple of nice repairs, a break of this bear market trend line, and then a break of this purple trend line over here. A lot of people remain tactically bearish on the markets because of what they say is the macro. At the end of the day, you have to follow what's happening on the charts. We can't get comfortable. This over here is a rising wedge. This is a bearish pattern. This is a downtrend. This is a bearish continuation pattern if it breaks down this way. Bitcoin also could wind up coming under pressure. Let me see if I can find a chart of Bitcoin to pull up for you. I know I got one of Bitcoin. <laughs> there we go. Now I'm going to look at this with you. Uh, mm. And in relation to the way that we just looked at the NASDAQ. All right. So, oh, I had this. Hold on one second for me, buddy. All right. Let me do one thing before we get into it. All right. Yeah. I'm going to take this course. line over here and you're like, what is that random line and why is it there? All right. Go ahead and go with this. Weird. No, I mean I can understand what we go, I, have, I got right here. I, I have a chart. I have a chart that I made uh, uh, like about two years ago, or a year, basically when we were about when we were on the pullback, the initial pullback off sixty four thousand. I went through and spent about three hours just taking a horizontal ray and finding any two touch points on any. It was on like the four hour chart. And it mapped out, I mean, it, it looks like a crazy person murder map, trying murder mystery. But what I, and, and I don't typically show it on stream because it's not necessarily understandable and it's not meant specifically to be traded. But really what I was trying to do was I was, it's more of like an experiment. I wanted to see of all, all the different two oh, touch points that I could find, how far into the future those, those basically uh, lines, spider lines, projected rays, whatever you want to call them, would play out. And the entire breakdown, the, pr the price action was bouncing between various lines from, from price action months and months ago. So, no, I, I, I appreciate You're going to love uh, this. You're going to love this right here then. I mean, you're really going to appreciate this. And, and you can see that line. You might be thinking, what, what is that line? That line comes off of the bottom over here. I can't. It's so weird. That line comes off of over here. I drew this line connecting these two points originally, okay? And this is the, the, the most recent bottom. This line, by the way, if, if we want, will continue to be the structure of the market all the way throughout Bitcoin. But what I wanna show you is this. I wanna take this line again. I'm gonna clone that line one more time, Kelly. And I'm showing you where we just bottomed out, right? Just bottomed over here. <laughs> That's okay. ridiculous, yeah. No, 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 hold on a second. 
No, I'm coming off awesome, ridiculous. Over here. I yeah. want you to show you what I'm doing. I'm coming off the top over here, the close over here. And again, that you can see that's where we bottomed out. And I could keep doing that, but I want to show you really where it gets a little bit of interesting is, is the lineup over here where we're coming into resistance. Again, we have we have some closes. We got some uh, right over here, touches into the line. Again, it finds support. Here it finds resistance. Resistance, that's where we're finding that top resistance. You might think it's this horizontal resistance, which it is. That's the resistance over here. After Luna collapsed, right, in May, it then bounced and found some resist some support over here. And that's the resistance we're into. But you could see this, this trend line resistance continues. So it's just a really neat way of looking at the market. And the reason I have this line over here is because I know it comes from down over here. And I know that right now, why we're testing this resistance, if we, if we break below and close below this line, then likely we're going to come in and test this broken resistance here that now should be support. That's why it's there. And what's really neat, and this is kind of fun to do if I continue taking that line and I could say, well, even right there, look. And that wow. line even is the, is the top over here in April. And, and you could just, if you wanted to keep playing, go back with it. And, but that's the, that's the structure of the market. And it gets really complicated because as you said, you could keep connecting lines and they'll keep playing off each other. And if the question is, how do you trade in between that? And before I show you, I want to show you one other thing. All right. Pretty neat though, right, Kelly? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it reminds me of uh, s s several years ago when I found Crypto Face for the first time. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I remember him saying, uh, you know, th this is probably three years ago or so. He had made a comment live on stream about, uh, and, and we were on, he was on a very small time frame, like a uh, 24 minute or 30 minutes, something like that. He goes, well, and he was pointing out how interesting a pattern structure was. He goes, well, look at this. And then, and he made this comment about how regularly, not just in Bitcoin, but in a lot of, a lot of assets, patterns tend to repeat themselves, structures repeat themselves. And he was showing on a 30 minute chart, the exact same structure that it played out at the previous, uh, some previous macro uh, breakdown in price the same structure was present that was developing on a 30 minute chart. Uh, and everybody was wondering why he was taking this huge short uh, because everything, everybody else thought it was bullish. He goes, well, I can, I've seen that this, this structure on this asset has played out this way in the past. And so I'm going to lean into the historical regularity of action that's happened within this market, even on the small time frame. And he, you know, he, he cleared like $800,000 on that short where most people were eaten alive by the market because they wanted it to go up. And all he did was look at the regularity of pattern. And he looked at the technicals, the data that he was seeing rather than the emotion of having a directional bias, which all of us, you, me, every single person yeah. in the market, we've all been victims of ourselves for sure. Uh, the, to be a successful trader, to be a successful investor, you need to know thyself. It's so important. You're completely yeah. human. If you don't have a bias, something's wrong with you. Now, the, there's a difference between understanding you have a bias and then learning to acknowledge what your bias is and how it's forming your opinion and then learning to be able to trade within that. And then the more you grow as an investor, as a trader, the more time you'll be spending to the view opposed to your bias. When you see me looking yeah. at the NASDAQ right now and I'm looking for where it breaks down, it's because that we've been taking these, these bullish uh, repairs that have taken place. So now I continue to look for where I'm wrong. That includes where we are on Bitcoin, right? Now I know right now from where we are in Bitcoin that we are actually, uh, we've seen this massive, Kelly, you know what the most massive repair that's taken place in the last three months has been? It wasn't this breakout over here. This is a trend line coming from the all-time high and then all the way down. And you can see that we broke out and that's a really important repair. And you can see that we retested it and resumed off right into the resistance of where Luna collapsed and, and peaked into. And then after the collapse of Celsius in three arrows, price retraced into that what? That support, now resistance. On the breakout, we retest coming to that resistance. And then this is a, a banking crisis in the United States, the US banking crisis. 
comes in and touches that level again. This is a very important repair. But the most important thing is this, this noise you see at the bottom, this line that says previous cycle ceiling. Most people think that the important point to look at was the all-time high in 2017 of Bitcoin, 19600 That That was the highest price point. That's what I'm going to focus in on. Let me go ahead and show you where that is right over here. You could see that price for a few days traded above this previous cycle ceiling and up until 19600 But you could see prior price was forming resistance. After trading above it briefly, price comes down and again finds resistance. And then that holds until we get to the breakout of the bull market. This is the breakout of the bull market in 2020. That same level is retested and now becomes support. So as everyone in this, this past uh, December, January, was looking for Bitcoin to come make some like lower lows and I'm watching the previous cycle ceiling over here is where I make the call that watch out for the prediction of the beginning of the bull market price closes above it and then back below. That means you, if you got long here, you have to get back short. It's invalidated until we came back above here. This was the first important repair getting above that major level that the market showed us. This was also coming off of what the, all the uncertainty in the space with the major scam, scammy scams, massive fraud, and FTX collapsing, your mom, my godfather calling me, are you okay? What happened to Bitcoin? Yeah. I can't explain that it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. You know, right. they, they, yeah. they don't get, they don't understand it. Uh, anyway, here's where we are right now. Let me show you this from another lens though. And this is how we wound up going about it. And you could see, Kelly, you might even saw this tweet. There was massive fear down here. Bitcoin trading under $17,000. People thinking that we're going down to 10,000. Lots of people believing that, embracing that. I'm entering long over here, Kelly. Taking it to start the year, this nice 23% gain off of Bitcoin. How do I do it? Why did I do that? Even though I could look at the markets, by the way, I didn't get a chance to show you this one. This line over here, this light line, this is where we'll have the confirmation. This will be the last repair that likely with the highest probability that the bull market is really beginning. Now, you can see over here when we, when we broke above this, this is where I called the breakout of the last bull market. This is going back uh, the previous cycle. Here it is again. And that's good, Kelly, but that's really late. Why do I say that's late? Well, if the same way that we looked at the structure of the market on that Bitcoin chart, and I was showing you those trend lines, these same trend lines here, they wound up, they wound up playing. And if, if I go ahead and I move these down, here's your April high, right? And look, that's where we kicked up into April 2020. They touched perfectly. And every time I just keep moving this down until over here where we have the breakout above, it's actually the beginning of the bull market. And you can see over here, mm. you could do it again, bring it down, bring it down. That's actually the beginning of the bull market. Same thing over here, bring it down. That's actually the beginning of the bull market. And that's early. There's a big difference between being early and being safe and, and getting it right. And when price breaks above here, okay, that's a good time. But this is, we're looking to be the best we could be. And even though I can right. look at multiple different TA, uh, that it, I feel like I have my own method of TA, but I hope each and every one of you develop your own method of TA because it really means that yeah. you've spent time with the charts and it fits your personality and it'll help you see it. But even with all of that, Kelly, you asked me in the very beginning, when would I tell someone to buy and why? And I want to look at this through this lens with you. A lot of people tell people that they should dollar cost average. And, and you know what? When I'm talking to my mom, as you probably do, it's it's the best thing to tell her. Because right. if she's they don't not have the devoting understanding, yeah. And yeah. she's not devoting the time it takes to do anything better, it's 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 probably in the long run really good strategy. I had one of my childhood best friends uh, throughout 2022, dollar cost averaging. 
And I remember when Bitcoin finally broke above, I think 21,000, he was finally like in the green and he was able to save a certain amount of Bitcoin and finally worked out in his favor. And that was a good thing. So he was able to understand this really easy when I showed him that there's a much better way than dollar cost averaging. And let me show you. It's very, it's very simple. I'm just going to come back over here to the beginning of 2022, because that's really when everyone knows that we had this massive uh, bear market. I could come back a little bit further, but I, but I wouldn't, but I'm not going to. And Kelly, if I told you, let me, let me take that off. Let me, let me take off the cells, right? This is just people looking to buy. And if I told you that you exit Bitcoin over here, or let me tell you exactly where it was, Kelly. This is really going to click for a lot of people on why there's a much better way than dollar cost averaging. You, over here, your do, every time it turns green, your dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. You, whatever your account is, if you start with $1,000 or $100,000 or whatever it is, every time you get a buy signal, you go all in and then all out. Now, if you are dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin, eventually, maybe it's around $20,000, you wind up actually being in the green, but you lost a massive amount of purchasing power. And by the way, Bitcoin came off 75%. That means you need a 400% increase just to get back to break even. If you get out of Bitcoin and stay on the sidelines and then over here, 100% all in, okay, that, that, that's actually a 4% loss, right? But I'm on the sidelines preserving that capital for the next time it's time for me to go in. You will, over the cost of the next five, 10 years, do significantly better than if you were just dollar cost averaging. This is how I start people off with and I show them. Here, here's an account for $10,000, right? And let's say you're doing this for, for 10 years. And what, what type of rate of return are you looking for? Some people believe that Bitcoin could have a 70% annual compounded growth over the next 10 years. It has up until now, and it, it could. It could have that type of growth. And by the way, if you're doing that and you're dollar cost averaging, right, starting with $10,000, and let's say that you're adding another what? Uh, well, we'll start slow, another $100 a, a month. You could see that compounding can really goes really begins to work. Let's say it's another three thousand dollars a year. You could see the difference that that compounding has. But Kelly, I don't know that we will have a you know a seventy percent average growth over the next ten years or not in Bitcoin. There are people like Stanley Drunkenmiller. He's a legend of legends in Wall Street, and he thinks that over the next ten years we might have like a sideways decade. They call it a lost decade in markets. And I, I, that's how I learned to trade 2000 to 2010. It was, you know, two crises and a sideways yeah. market. I know people like to think that Bitcoin's going straight up and to the right, but I don't know what happens well, by going me, ahead. and Let me ask you, let me ask you a question there, because I, I've, I've kind of tossed this idea around with uh, Ben and TJ uh, over hit network and a number of other analysts and I, you know, I'm kind of of the, and this is a complete theory, so don't take this as, 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 uh, as doctrine, but I'm curious your thoughts on it. I, I, I feel like there's obviously a, a huge growth potential in Bitcoin over the next 30 years. Of course, that's why I invest and trade in it. Um, uh, there's, there's one sort of uh, frame of thought of this, uh, this law or this theory of diminishing returns. We've seen no cycle uh, beat the previous cycle's gains uh, in terms of a bullish uh, price action uh, uh, increase in value of uh, the, the, on the the market value on exchange, but on the other hand, I do also see a huge gate with a lot of people starting to stack up against the gate that are now aware of Bitcoin, but there's a sort of uncertainty. Uh, the gate is uncertainty, and that's you know obviously large in part due to uh, lack of clarity from uh, from government bodies, whether it's the U.S., the U.K., uh, it's anywhere in Europe. Um, but there's a lot of money on the sidelines where there is interest or burgeoning interest that's coming in. And we're so early in the adoption of Bitcoin. I still think that I think that we are going to have 
at, at least one, uh, whether we want to call it a super cycle or so, I, I think that we do have a potential to have one more cycle that is, uh, I don't think it's going to be multiple cycles, but one cycle, whether it's this next bull cycle or the one following that has a higher rate of return uh, than the previous. And then from then on out, it, it's going to be diminishing returns and cycles after that, uh, because there's such a, there's such adoption uh, that's waiting on the sidelines for a little clarity, pension funds, institutions. Uh, I, I mean, the list goes on and on. I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Or, or do you think there's always going to be other economic factors that come in with the fear of liquidity coming out of traditional financial systems that are, you know, are going to come in that, if we are going to have that sort of likelihood that come in and squash the market to prevent it, to sort of stifle uh, not only the growth in Bitcoin, but we have to be aware the growth of Bitcoin also comes at a cost of lack of liquidity going into the traditional systems. What's your thoughts uh, in that sort of, uh, in that regard? Yeah. I mean, one of three things could happen uh, and actually a lot more than one of three things could happen, but to yeah. make this conversation simple and get the point across one of three things could happen People talk about this massive amount of mo money in the credit markets. And let's just say that it's $400 trillion. And if you were ever to see anything like it's called hyper Bitcoinization take place, where like the system is failing and there's basically a cascade of money inflowing into the Bitcoin market, I mean, you're going to see literally overnight Bitcoin crash upwards. And a lot of people are going to be like very late. They're going to see Bitcoin jumping up $100,000 the next day, another $300,000 until eventually they have no choice but to take whatever money they have that's dwindling in, in power and purchasing power and buy into Bitcoin. And there's a saying that people buy into Bitcoin at the price they deserve. And and that could happen, uh, unfortunately, for the people we love and care about uh, on a small scale like that, as well as institutions and governments of the world. And, and if you're seeing that, there's no such thing as diminishing returns. Diminishing returns, meaning that from one cycle to the next, you are seeing a lesser degree of gain that takes place. Now, there is diminishing returns that takes place on the amount of QE. When I talked about these astonishing numbers of of 600 or 700 billion dollars that they wound up going ahead and expanding the balance sheet for the banker bailout we thought that number was enormous except over here they did 4.1 trillion dollars and the next time that they're forced to do it it's going to be dizzying because and there's diminishing returns eventually on the power that we'll have one day they're going to end up shooting off a bazooka and the price is going to go up and then crash down it's it's why monetary reset is happening, but that's not happening with Bitcoin. Another thing that could happen is that simply that we continue to see more cycles occurring as they are right here. And for example, you know, this next cycle, maybe Bitcoin comes up and anything under, I think, I think it's 160 or $180,000 would be diminishing returns from the last cycle. And likely that happens. But the cycle after that, if we continue to see the adoption of Bitcoin at the current rate that it is being adopted, likely after that, it's going to enter this ultimate market opportunity. And if you look, and if anyone watching goes back and looks at a chart of Amazon, look at it on the weekly, and you're going to see the same exact pattern, except when it hits the ultimate market opportunity, it has this hype face. It's not just Amazon, Microsoft did it, and a litany of others, NVIDIA, it doesn't matter what you look at. Then they go through this phase and it looks like diminishing returns until they reach the ultimate market opportunity, meaning they're here to stay. And then you start seeing exponential growth. And yeah, I wanna, I wanna I'm, for just a second, I'm gonna, you're not gonna be able to see this, but I'm just pivoting here just to show people, I'm, I, this is on Glassnode. You, you, 
for all of you, if you don't have Glassnode, you can come over to lookintobitcoin.com or looknode.com or checkonchain.com, all of which have free on-chain data charts. But what I'm showing them, Jordan, is this is on Bitcoin. This is the total addresses. And I want you all to look at this black line on, this is a Bitcoin price. And what we're seeing here is essentially a parabolic growth of total addresses over time. This is just going even even right here. Look at this. This is as price is falling in that that seemingly never ending bear market of 2022 uh, coming all the way down here, and we're only seeing addresses go up. If we look at new addresses, and I can smooth this out uh, on like a 14 day uh, SMA, we can see even with new addresses. We're seeing as the price fell, yes, we did have a little bit of a, a, a decrease in the number of new addresses, but we're still seeing right here, even where uh, as just just at the same spot that uh, Jordan pointed out, pre-FTX crash, this is uh, looking roughly uh, June 18th, 2022, when there could have been a likely floor had the FTX uh, collapse not happened. We're seeing at this point, strong increase that is just sustained through with a little bit of little dips here and there, strong increase of new addresses. But this is right here. This is what's interesting. Total addresses, the number of address, I mean, this is just blowing up over time. And uh, you can throw it back, uh, back to you on screen here, Jordan. I just wanted to show people yeah. that that's the difference between and this is one of the things as he was mentioning the the, the necessity for you to have uh to feel confident and not feel feel fearful in a market is to be educated on data within the market looking at price and only price will only stir emotion and bad decisions because it's not going to allow you to be patient. Looking at data, whether it's a, a, a variety and a grouping of on-chain data or traditional assets or the global liquidity or technical indicators, the point is, as he mentioned before, we I have my own strategy. Jordan has his own strategy. Benjamin Cowan has his own strategy. Everybody has their own strategy, and I can teach you my strategy. It may not work for you, but what I can do and what Jordan can do, any of the, the different YouTube or different places of content that you go, whether it's an encyclopedia or your YouTube channel, it's up to each one of you here in the channel to figure out what your risk tolerance is, what your time horizon is, what your strategy is. And if you can't do those three things, then I advise you to wait to enter any positions in the market because the market's going to eat you alive if you don't do those three basic things before you jump into the market. I just wanted to make that comment and throw it back over to you, Mr. Jordan. I mean, that's priceless right there. I mean, if, if you get the opportunity, if you're watching this on the replay, go back and listen to that again. And then one more time, because before anything else, you want to really understand that. And if, you, if you're hearing that, you don't yet understand it then you want to pay attention to that. And then at some point in the near future, you're going to understand that. And that's everything right there. That's the only way to make it. There's no question about that. To go back to the question we were just talking about, and it's all dependent on you were just showing the new addresses. If the third thing that could happen is for some reason, all of a sudden, Bitcoin doesn't grow anymore in the network effects. There's no longer uh, people you know, entering into the space. This whole S curve is dependent on the adoption of the technology. Bitcoin is technology. And if it's no longer being adopted, if there's no longer the hash rate starts going down because people are no longer securing the network, those are the only two things that, that I would personally view as red flags. If all of a sudden there was less uh, security on the network, less hash rate and or new addresses, then I would say, well, likely something is wrong and we're not going to see continued adoption. Those would really cause me to rethink my overall thesis. And that's the third thing that can happen. I mean, Bitcoin could fail. People don't like to ever say that. But the truth is, you just don't know. So you better have more than one backup plan. And the other thing I want to say is we could enter into a period here of into 2030, where it looks something like this. Go back and look at the NASDAQ from 2000 to 2010. It's completely possible. You just don't know. Now, I do feel like you, Kelly, and that in the future, diminishing returns will actually be disproven. I, I truly feel like people will one day realize, oh, wait a second. But the thing is, is if that 
right now the data going back and looking at two past cycles, it shows diminishing returns. So if you start talking to people about what past S curves have done, most people aren't really able to kind of be there and get there. And it's, it's almost like they need to be focused. We need to be focused on what's happening now. There's a lot happening. It's enough to get my mind around. Man, I, I, I could sit and listen to you for another 42 hours. I know we're coming up on uh pushing up on an hour and 24 minutes let's let's uh let's because we're going to be uh you know for anybody that's uh watching this we are recording this midweek uh this should be uh coming out on saturday so i do i do want to wish everybody and i hope you're having a wonderful weekend and i want to say i appreciate me and jordan both appreciate you being here uh with us and any of the time that you spend on your own education education is the best asset in the world other than time and in order to get education what do you have to spend time and so in reality, time is the best asset in the world. And what do we want to earn Bitcoin for? What do we want to have better uh, growing investments for so that we can have more freedom of time? So as we're, I, I just want to shout out everybody that's in the chat right now, uh, you know, Throw in when your born on date was, either in the live chat uh, that's next to this or in the comments down below. What month and year did you first hear about Bitcoin? What month and year did you make your first purchase? If you're on the sidelines, say you're on the sidelines. It's okay. There's every. There's no right answer or wrong answer for anybody. It, this goes back to risk exposure, risk tolerance, and knowledge. You're here to. You're here learning, and so I just want to commend you all. As we wrap this out, uh, you know, do, do you, Jordan? Is there anything else? First, I want to say thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for for all your time and wisdom. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, any other la uh, last sort of thoughts in, uh, over the next five minutes or so that you uh, wanted to? Uh, whether it's encouragement, a strategy, a key edge, any any anything that comes to mind uh, as as we're you know right now it's April 2023. These videos that we do here on BitLab are meant to be watched really at any time because we're talking about strategies and concepts, but. What, what would you say, uh, what comes to mind that, that you'd like to share with anybody that's either in the space or entering the space to, to help give them some encouragement and a little bit more of an edge? Yeah, Kelly, first of all, I enjoy talking markets so much. I enjoy talking markets with you. So it's it's a pleasure. I can't believe an hour and a half has passed by. It seems like, you know, 10 like minutes. And there's so much to talk about that I try to be so brief in each thing. And it's just like introducing these little bit of nuggets and then, you know, hopefully someone is interested in it. They go learn more about it, whether it's, you know, whatever it was we talked about. And as far as, as, as strategies and things like that, I know that BitLabs has an academy where they teach fundamentals. It's a great place to start. Um, you know, what you just said, as far as risk management, you know, if you don't have a strategy, if you don't have a well-developed edge in the markets, then I suggest not investing in the markets at all. You could go to like maybe a dollar cost average strategy and build up, uh, you know, begin building up a position, but you're much better off investing that precious time in building up your own knowledge. And then when you're ready to invest in the markets, begin investing in the markets because it's not going to work out well the other way. It's nothing easy about it. Yeah. It takes a massive amount of time and effort to be able to develop a winning edge in the market. Spend your time on that. Just spend your time learning, researching. Likely, you should not be trading if you're listening to this. <laughs> Likely, you should be joining the BitLabs Academy or whatever other resource you could find. And that is gonna take you a lot further. Uh, listen, don't do it. Do, do not invest until you're ready. I know the work it's taken to develop a well-formed edge in the market. It's, it's a massive effort. That's what I was, That's what I like to share with. But you, you know what that makes me think of, I, I was mentioning this this week uh, on stream, you know, when we look at professional athletes, we have this uh, sort of unhumble view that they are God gifted and they very well may be in some aspects of whether it be physicality or height or agility, but none of that is no, but no professional athlete that's at the top of the world in their field, whether it's Tiger Woods, whether it's LeBron James, uh, uh, Kobe Bryant, uh, they did have natural ability, but there's a lot of people in the world that have natural ability. What sets professionals apart in any industry is the ability to have the audacity and the and the compassion for themselves to to lean into the courage 
to spend their time doing fundamentals over and over and over. Tiger Woods at the top of his Kobe game. Bryant, always, great always, example always, of the yeah. work ethic. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, you know what? The, the truth of it is, is no matter how good you are, no matter how much talent you have, without discipline, you are nothing. Hmm. And that's what separates the best of the best is their work ethic. And that's, and that, and that, that's the truth of it. So with so that I, being said, everybody yeah. here on the, on the, on the, on the, in, in the stream watching, if you haven't yet, make sure you come over to Jordan Lindsay's page, give him a follow, check out his content. He's got a lot of great stuff going on here. Check out his website, which is right here. Uh, and make sure engage with it. He's a wonderful, wonderful individual. Uh, I'm so honored to have had him on the show. I look forward to having him back in the near future. And for everybody, if you're feeling either discouraged or hesitant or, uh, you know, every time you buy the market drops or every time you sell the market goes up, don't, look at it as uh, you have some curse. Your strategy was wrong, not you. So change your strategy it's in, yeah. invest more time rather than trying to invest in the market, invest more time in learning about the market. And I mean, go back and watch this video. Jordan dropped, a, a, I mean, there's so many bombshells in here and gems. I really appreciate it. And Jordan, I can't, uh, very honored to have you on and I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, everyone. God bless, talk to you later. Adios, my friend. I'll talk to you very much. I'll talk to you soon. And everybody have a wonderful weekend. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button on your way out of the, uh, of the stream. Ding the bell. Be a part of our community. And we will see you all in the next episode. I'll have a wonderful weekend and adios.